around the district. And to kick us off, I want to bring to the stage our district director of logistics, Mary Reed. Sergeant at Arms, secure all doors. Help me bring to our lecture our contest chair, Mark Castino. Did, did I pronounce it correctly? Mosquito. Mosquino. 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 But she know? Did I get it right yet? Our, our advanced communicator, Silver, and our advanced leadership, Bronze. Let's put your hands together as you come forward. There was a little mix up, so I'll give it a course. Meschino, like my, like my ex wife said, like Chianti. Yes. <laughs> the first time she 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 said my name and she said it correctly, I was like, how come? Because it's like Chianti. It's M A S C H. C H like Chianti. I was like, what the But I still married her anyways. <laughs> so as I arrived here today, I was ready to do my job as concert, contest chair, and then I saw the evaluation contest. Cheryl Miller, the contest chair, introduced the Toastmasters. I was like, okay, I had to get out of this. Because I wasn't ready to do it. And then we saw Cornelius tell us that he had been here for less than a month. So I said, well, since I've been here for more, more than a few months, I have to do it. So enough about me. As you know, I'm here to introduce our Toastmaster for the 2016 Humor Speech Contest. Our to Toastmaster, I don't know how to know this, uh, is Betty Jacobucci. She is last year's Humorous Speech Contest winner. Yeah. So she definitely knows about humor. Uh, Betty it, has been a Toastmaster for 11 years. She is with Park Ridge Toastmasters. She has uh, done her 10 speeches for ACG, but she doesn't have the ACG yet because she still has to do that extra pen. <laughs> <laughs> so please help me welcome Betty Jacobucci.
is Steve Serby. Number two is <laughs> Number three is Shanti Arbery. Oh, number two. Slow down. Okay, oh, I'm sorry. I haven't done it. Number one. I can't be a type of two. Uh-huh. Not yet. Yeah, no title yet. Not title. Okay. Number two. Oh, Steve. Steve Serbi. That's one. Number two is Ying Minian. Ying Minian. Number two. Great job. Number three, Shanti's Ar Arlington. Shanti's Arlington. Number four, Marad S. Shah. Marad S. Shah. Number five is Siddharth Shire. Number five, Siddharth Shire. Number six is me, Kim Chavez. Me, Kim Chavez. Number six. Number seven is Michael Melanowski. Michael Melanowski, number seven. Number eight is Calvin Gibbs, Jr. Calvin Gibbs, Jr., number eight. Number nine is Martina Matizen. Martina Matizen, number nine. We will now proceed with the humor speech contest, and there will be one minute of silence before the first contestant, and between each contestant. Timekeepers, when I advise you to do so, please signal me with the green light when one minute is up. For after all the contestants, has spoken. The judges will be given all the time they need to complete their challenge. We will now begin the humorous speech contest. Julio, he asked me, 
Would you want a marathon with me? I said, sure. I got you. We signed up. He started training. I posted a training program on my wall. <laughs> we walked past each other like, hey, man. You gonna run today? Nah, tomorrow, tomorrow. <laughs> so I made up my mind I wasn't gonna run. And he asked me to go to the expo where you pick up your number. If you don't know the Marathon Expo, it's a blast of inspiration. And I was so inspired. Oh, no. I'm going to run tomorrow without training. <laughs> that night, I was in the dark room watching motivational videos. <laughs> Whatever the mind can believe. <laughs>
stairs. I'd stand there thinking, you need to use your mother's superpowers and help me get my package. And it's lucky for her that my baby Toastmaster skills hadn't developed yet. Because if they had, she would not have liked my evaluation. Fast forward. Thank you. 
they're valid. Contestant number four, Mirage Esta. Mirage Esta. Another one. Another. Mirage Esta. Another one. Another. Dear fellow Toastmasters and honored guests, every time my wife and I go on a flight, something always goes wrong. Mm -hmm. The reason? This guy. <laughs> this more from the Gremlins movie, who creates chaos every single time my wife and I go on a flight. The reason? We didn't take him with us on our honeymoon. <laughs> the troubles began before the travel began. First, the taxi was late. We rushed to the airport only to find out that the flight was late. We barely made it to the connecting flight and I almost threw the documents at the travel agent and I said, take whatever you need and send us on our way. We get to St. Thomas, nice weather, White sandy beaches, relaxing time. We forgot all the problems of the travel. But then it was time to come back home. <laughs> we get to the airport and find out the tickets are missing. <laughs> he, made, he made the agent take the wrong tickets at the connecting flight. As a result, we had to buy tickets at full price. $2,000 just to come back home. Wow. Thank you, Gizmo. Some honeymoon. <laughs> the following year, we went to Florida to visit Mickey Mouse. <laughs> and this time, we took him with us. So you can imagine, the flight, the taxi was on time, the flight was on time, mm -hmm. but the luggage never made it. <laughs> For three days, Orlando, mid-August, 150 Fahrenheit, unbelievable humidity, we didn't have our clothes. <laughs> Same old stinky clothes <laughs> for three days. Magic Kingdom, Epcot Center, MGM Studios. <sighs> People around us. Who are those guys? <laughs> what is going on? Something's wrong with these people. We didn't have a choice. Some vacation. The next year, we went to India for my sister's wedding. Mm -hmm. And this time, we upgraded it 
to the luggage. <laughs> or so we thought. And you can imagine, the taxi was on time, the flight was on time, and even the luggage made it. We had a fantastic time at the wedding. But this guy was waiting. <laughs> on the way back home, the flight from Bombay to Amsterdam, smooth sailing, absolutely no problems at all. Everything went fine. But the flight from Amsterdam to Chicago is when he struck. <laughs> we had to go from Terminal 1 to Terminal 2 on a shuttle. Here I am with the luggage. I get on shuttle 1. They had two, turn two shuttles. I get on the first shuttle with this luggage. And before I know it, he figures out a way to close the door before my wife can get on. <laughs> so here I am on the shuttle. And there she is on the station with the documents. Okay. Now what? Should I stay or go back? I decided I would go back. And of course she's not there. <laughs> Dilemma. Should I stay or go? And I decided to go. And I see her going on the other train. For the next half hour, back and forth, people are wondering, has this guy lost his mind? Is he having fun collecting frequent rider points? Maybe he's enjoying the scenic crowd on the subway. Fifteen minutes before the check-in counter was to close, I get to the gate, and she is waiting for me. children are not around. He doesn't attack when the boys are there because he likes them. Now the older one has a job and has moved out and the younger one is with us but he is going to college very soon. Nine months from now we are planning on a trip to India and I said to my wife this time I am taking this guy with me. He's going to be with me. But my wife says to me, one fine morning, I'm not taking any chances. Honey, time for another one. Madam <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
contestant number five, Sid Hart, shall ring. Maybe later. Sid Hart, shall ring. Maybe later. Along with being a part of my Toastmasters club, I'm a part of another club, the Procrastinators Club. <laughs> <laughs> and the first rule of the Procrastinators Club is, I'll tell you later. <laughs> Madam Contest Master, fellow Toastmasters, welcome guests, and good looking judges. <laughs> I promised myself that I would finish writing my speech at least a week before the contest. Nonetheless, there I was sitting two days before the contest trying to figure out what I'm going to speak about. Obviously, I did not stick to my own deadline. I was in a state of panic. I even wondered if I could fake my own death so I would have a good excuse not to participate. <laughs> but before I did anything this drastic, I decided to consult the love of my life, my rock, the wind beneath my wings. But she was busy and I had to speak to my wife instead. <laughs> I said, babe, please help me. She said, no. You decided to procrastinate and you need to learn not to. But I said, procrastination is a good thing. She said, Tell me why. Give me three good reasons why procrastination is a good thing. I knew I should not have given her that competent communication manual to read. <laughs> I explained. Procrastination is good for your mental health. Religious people believe in heaven. Procrastinators believe in tomorrow. <laughs> It's a mystical land where 99% of human productivity, motivation, and achievements are stored. <laughs> Procrastinators believe there will be a tomorrow, and hence they tend to be optimistic. <laughs> they also have a high sense of self-worth. After all, to be a successful procrastinator, you have to believe in yourself. You have to believe that you can complete a task at the last moment. You have to believe that you can finish studying for the exam the day before. You have to believe that you can prepare your speech two days before the contest. I say all of this as somebody who has been procrastinating since they were a child. I procrastinated so much that I'm surprised I managed to grow up. This did not stop me from learning new things though. And that is another beauty of procrastination. Along with being good for your mental health, procrastination helps you learn things creatively. <laughs> to prove my point, I showed my wife my last few Google searches. Thank God I raised my search history before that. <laughs> Here they are. Ways to reuse stickers that are not sticky anymore. <laughs> How to cheat at poker. Ethics for everyday living. <laughs> Selection criteria for a Thanksgiving turkey. Why am I so perfect? <laughs> Telltale signs of narcissism. <laughs> and why isn't 11 pronounced 1D1? <laughs> this is exactly what procrastinators tend to do. When something of importance needs to be done, they distract themselves with something else instead. <laughs> now to you all, this may seem like a bad thing. However, they're learning things that they usually won't during the normal course of life. <laughs> According to Professor John Perry of Stanford University, this type of distraction is called structured procrastination. The beauty of this is, you don't have to stop procrastinating. In fact, you take that opportunity to learn new things. Learn to dance while you procrastinate writing that paper. Learn to paint 
Why do you procrastinate completing that assignment? In fact, miss, the next time your boss gives you an important project to complete and catches you singing in the bathroom instead, tell her that you're engaging in structured procrastination. <laughs> tell her that you'll complete the project and be a better singer. <laughs> Now, I see the perfectionists in the room thinking to themselves, this is not how you master a skill. <laughs> and to you, I say, relax. This can help you as well. After all, procrastination is a cure for perfectionism. <laughs> perfectionists want to do everything perfectly. They want their speech to be perfect. They want their essay to be perfect. They even want to buy milk perfectly. To achieve this, they spend hours and hours at a task, and they're still not happy with the results. When you procrastinate, you don't have hours and hours. You have just enough time to do an adequate job. 99% of the time, an adequate job is more than good enough. Procrastination gives perfectionists the permission to do an imperfect job and be happy with the results. <laughs> Done over and over, this reinforces the behavior that maybe perfection is not needed in every aspect of life. <laughs> Friends, as you can see, I have very good reasons for being a procrastinator. <coughs> it helps me with my mental health, <laughs> it helps me learn things creatively, and it helps me not be perfect. A sentiment that my wife enthusiastically agreed with. <laughs> Everyone should procrastinate at some point of time. In fact, the sooner you procrastinate, the sooner you can get to what needs to be done. Anyway, I promised my wife that if she insisted, I would get help. Not today, though. <laughs> First, I need to go look up why don't they make mouse-flavored cat food? Yeah. <laughs> I am not this fast Contestant number six, Mi Kim Chavez, Toastmasters Unplugged. Mi Kim Chavez, Toastmasters Unplugged. you 
I must confess, there is nothing humorous about trying to shove humor into a speech. <laughs> it is downright painful. <clears throat> and before every speech, I think in my head, I'm going to sign up a month in advance. Two weeks before, I'm going to have it all written out. And a week before, I'm going to practice it every single day so that when my day comes, I am golden. <laughs> well, that never happens. <laughs> the reality looks more like this. Just like Siddharth, two days before my speech is due, <laughs> I am in a complete panic mode. I've got five different ideas. None of them developed, and I go into a complete shutdown. I turn off my computer, I turn off my phone, I stop feeding my kids. <laughs> and if my husband ever dares to even ask what's for dinner, he is in so much trouble. <laughs> time in my Chavez household. <laughs> Not because mom is PMSing, <laughs> but because mom is PSSing. <laughs> Pre-speech syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> it usually comes once a month. <laughs> Those filler words. 
seriously, you're going to sit there and mark off all those um, uhs, and so's? <laughs> I think they should give awards for people who have the most filler words because they don't even realize that they're saying it. <laughs> it takes talent, raw talent. <laughs> so all of these so-called helpful people telling me how long I can speak, how many filler words I've used, and if I've used a word of the day or not, I think I know when I've used a word of the day <laughs> And you're never going to believe what happened. Because just as I was wrapping up the speech, guess what came in the mail? My Toastmaster Competent Communications Diploma. Yeah. <laughs> and upon looking at this, I have to say, forget everything I just said because I love Toastmasters. <laughs> Number seven, Michael Malinowski, career worry. Michael Malinowski, career winner. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Toastmaster, distinguished dignitaries, fellow Toastmasters, and guests. I haven't had the opportunity to meet most of you. So I know you don't know my background. Tonight, I want to tell you about my career worries that I had in high school. Back then, I was thinking about becoming a Catholic priest. <laughs> what, you thought all these were going to be humorous speeches? <laughs> I've been asked by District 30 to speak here, to speak at this time, to give your face a rest. From all the laughter you already had, and the speakers that are going to follow. I attended Quigley Preparatory Seminary South High School in Chicago. Now, can't you just feel those muscles relax? I figured one good thing about becoming a priest was, you didn't have to worry about fashion. I was partially wearing black with a touch of white. But by my senior year, I decided against being a priest, because... As a priest, you're expected to work weekends. <laughs> you're laughing. You believe me, don't you? You don't think the lack of women had anything to do with my decision? I also was worried that I couldn't handle the stress of being a priest. I don't know if you think it, but priests have to deal with all sorts of situations, and they have to come up with creative solutions. And I didn't think I could handle that. I'll give you an example. We had a visiting priest come in from another country, and he talked to us seminarians about a stressful situation he had to deal with. A man died in his parish. The man was despicable. 
he was abusive to his wife and children. He extorted money, robbed people, even uh, murdered people. The brother of this man comes to the priest to make the funeral arrangements. Father, and what I didn't tell you is he was from another country. I can't say which country. I don't want to because you'll think I'm stereotyping, but let's just say it was from a country near the Catholic Church's corporate office. <laughs> <laughs> so the brother comes to the priest. Father, I want you to conduct the funeral for my thoroughly departed brother. And at the eulogy, I want you to tell the entire congregation that my brother, he was a saint. <laughs> if you do this for me, I will donate $3 million. Matter of fact, here's $100,000 for start. Now this stressed the priest out. There's no way he could say this man was a saint. But $3 million, the church was deteriorating, they really needed the money. He had a sleepless night worrying about what he was going to do. The next morning he gets up to do the eulogy. The man who will burn today he was a, a cheat. He was abusive to his lovely wife and children. He extorted the money. He robbed people. He even murdered people. But the next to his a brother, he was a saint. <laughs> well, that's creative. If we just think that there's an answer out there, we get our creative juices for it, right? And we come up with solutions. But man, when I was in high school, there's no way I could think like that. <laughs> Things didn't work out for me in the seminary. I don't want to go into all the details. But after they kicked me out of there, <laughs> I became an electrical engineer. Oh, wow. You know, you guys have been really awesome and supportive. I'll get to tell you one other thing that happened to me. We had a class where we had to practice sermons. And you got to think, back then I was the poster child for needing Toastmasters. And no joke, and unfortunately I found Toastmasters way too late. I should have had it earlier. But we had to do these sermons. If that wasn't bad enough, the bishop shows up to our class to listen to our sermons. Now that's like you giving a speech and your work VP shows up to give you a friendly evaluation. Well, I'm nervous and ill-prepared. You know, well, you do a speech two days before? Yeah, right. I wasn't there. Uh, <laughs> mine wasn't only boring, it was painful to listen to. But the, the bishop was cool. He pulls me on the side and gives me some pointers. He says, you really need to grab, just grab people's attention from the start. And he gives the example he used. He starts out by saying, Last week, I had a beautiful woman over for dinner. Get everybody's attention. Then he goes on by saying, she was my mother. <laughs> and talks about being respectful to your parents. It's like, OK. So I prepare my next suit. I got an audience catching open. But besides the bishop being there, the entire parent, teacher, counsel is there. I'm like sitting waiting my turn, and I'm just sweating. They call me up, and I'm shaking. I begin talking, and I'm stuttering. <laughs> oh, wait, somebody help us, please. <laughs> I, uh, I had a beautiful girl to stay overnight with me last night. <laughs> You're laughing, but they weren't. I, I, uh, I can't remember her name. I can feel my brain cells losing out of my sweat. I knew it didn't work out right. I had no idea what I was supposed to say next. But then I had a spark of memory. A spark that led into a disaster. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't remember her name. Uh, oh, but, but she came highly recommended by the bishop. <laughs>
while the judges mark their ballots. Contestant number eight, Calvin Gibbs Jr. It's always funny until <laughs> Calvin Gibbs Jr. It's always funny until. Thank you, Madam Contest Toastmaster. Fellow Toastmasters and honored guests, show of hands, how many of you have ever fallen or seen somebody fall? Show of hands. <laughs> Growing up, I used to love seeing people fall. <laughs> I mean, not fall and get hurt. I didn't want to see them bust their head to the white meat show, nothing like that. I just like to see people fall and then their reaction when they jump up. I grew up in New York City, in Brooklyn. But during the holiday times, I would love to go to Rockefeller Center, 30 Rock, where the skating rink was. Mm. And there I would have roasted chestnuts, mm. some hot cocoa, mm. and watch the skaters, all elegant, as they swerved around and did different figures and, 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 and twirl in the air. And I would, would be waiting. And waiting, and waiting, until the payoff, splat, and watch them try to bounce back up. And sometimes they couldn't get back up and splat again. I used to love it. I would be laughing so hard, I felt like I was going to lose my breath. But it's always funny until. On a trip to the Statue of Living, we was going up to the torch. Now, I don't know if you've ever been there. But as you go up in the torch, the staircase become narrower and narrower. And there's like a, a wind tunnel that comes up. And I had on my brand new Mets baseball cap. I had wanted this for a long time because the Mets, at that time, were just getting introduced to baseball. They had just been world champs. So I was wearing my hat proudly. And as we were going up the staircase, I felt a gust of wind and my hat flew off my head. So I said, got one chance to get it, so I leaped up. Oh, no. And when I came down, I missed the step. Oh, no. Now the guy in back of me had been on my butt the entire trip going up. All of a sudden, he wasn't there. <laughs> I fell back and banged my head on the step. So I'm laying like this, head down, looking at all the colors. Never did get the hat back. It's always funny until I used to walk the, the March of Dimes walkabout. They used to call it Walk America. And it was 25K, approximately 15 and a half miles. Start in Central Park, go to 103rd Street, all the way down to Battery Park, and then back up. I used to power walk. So I had a new girlfriend. I wanted to impress her. I said, come on, walk with me. So we did the walk. We're power walking. I had great endurance then, too. <laughs> we get to about mile 12. I step down off the curb. Out. Arms and legs <laughs> extended out. Meanwhile, there's hundreds of people all around me walking over and just laughing. I looked at my girlfriend, my new, my new girlfriend. She was laughing, too. Needless to say, we broke up shortly after that. <laughs> it's always funny until 
once my wife, and I'm going to get in trouble now, but she fell. We were on our way to church. She was crossing the street in the middle of the street. Bam! She was out. And instead of me helping her up, which would have been the husbandly thing to do, I reached for my phone. <laughs> and before I knew it, some guy from the neighborhood had swooped in and helped her up. And she's looking at me, why did you help me? I was going to, honey, but I was trying to get my phone. I thought maybe I would call 911. <laughs> yeah, it's always funny until I get home. <laughs> At the World Trade Center, I used to work in five World Trade. And the streets, the gutters, when it rained, would overflow. There would be a puddle right near the edge of the sidewalk. Now, those World Wall Street bankers and brokers, was not going to let their $150 wingtip shoes or their designer pumps get wet in the, in the water. So they would jump from the puddle onto the sidewalk. And the first time I saw that, every time it rained afterward, I would make sure I got a vantage point across the street. <laughs> because when they jumped and hit the sidewalk with some kind of marble or quartz, it was real shiny. But they would hit the sidewalk, splat! Often, every time. I would spend the entire lunch time out there watching them fall. I, got, I came late to lunch every time it rained because I would be out there laughing, watching them fall. Then on September 18th, 2001, three days before Aunt Sonia and I got married, I got off the L train at uh, the elevated line in Oak Park, and they had washed the platform. I took one step on the steps and slid down to the next landing. But it was a type of injury, the doctor said, that you might see a baseball player have as they slide into a base. So there I was at the first landing, covered with mud, dirty water, my clothes was all torn, my leg was like this behind me, I couldn't get up, I was saying people were coming up and down, I was like, Help me, please. <laughs> Help me, please. And they were throwing money at me. <laughs> I got a cheeseburger. I have a cheeseburger. <laughs> I ended up having a broken knee. The patella tendon was severed in back of it. On my left foot, I had a, a badly sprained uh, ankle. But we got married. I had a soft brace, an ankle brace, soft cast ankle brace. And I don't want anybody to feel bad for me because I had plenty of painkillers. <laughs> they even tell me I said, I do. <laughs> it's always funny until it happens to you, madam. <laughs> Contestant number nine, Martina Matisa, the third option. The, Martina Matisa, the third option. Madam Tulsa. 
Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters. When I was first married, I thought, wouldn't it be fun to have a baby? Wouldn't it just be fabulous, fulfilling to have a child? Which is interesting because on the day that I had the birth experience, fun, fulfilling, and fabulous were the F words I chose to describe it. <laughs> Actually, I had quadruplets, which is Yes! It's a very efficient pregnancy. Four babies, one pregnancy. It's like going to Costco. <laughs> babies in bulk. Well, they did great, but I had to get used to calling my first they. Now, I wanted to be a good mom, so I read everything I could get my hands on. I read How to Raise Resourceful, Creative Children. It's a good title. I wanted to know everything. What I didn't know was that child psychology and science fiction fantasy is the same thing. <laughs> I could have read Tolkien for my parenting. <laughs> but I, I read How to Raise Happy Multiples. You see, they're called multiples not just because of their birth circumstance, but because of the magnitude of mayhem and messes that are multiplied and manufactured in seismic proportions when they work in concert. And as I know, I once got out of the shower all fresh and clean and flabbergasted to discover that my kids had pushed the changing table all the way into the walk-in closet against the wall. They climbed up the outside like a ladder, they got under the top like a diving platform and literally dove into the clothes, grabbing onto the hangers and sliding down the fabric in a controlled fall into a pile of everything from every drawer in the room. I thought it was a five minute shower. Let's see, the problem is it didn't have puff like leaves do in the fall. So my kids, I read the book, Being Resourceful and Creative, took house plants by the stem, <laughs> shook the wood ball, um, yeah, poof. Now, did I rant? Did I rave? No, 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 my Toastmaster friends. I read. I read and I read and I read and I read. So they grew up. And finally, the time came for me to give those books away to the next new mom, my neighbor. She was perfect. She was young. She was totally optimistic, completely delusional. <laughs> so I set them up on the counter to take over, and I came across a book that I don't remember reading. I don't remember seeing this. It had a leather bound, it had gold on the edge. I don't remember this. So I just started thumbing through, and it was revealed to me. The third option in parenting. It isn't just love and acceptance or anger and frustration. There is a third option and is that what I want to share with my Toastmaster friends today. You can use this third option. You don't need to have little kids. It works for adult children too. <laughs> Would you like to know what the third option is? Yes. Oh my. It is to become an evil queen. <laughs> opportunity to exercise my new malevolent monarchy. <laughs> I didn't have to wait long. My daughter walked out of her room with her navel pierced. She did it herself. How do I respond? I'm now evil queen. When she turned around, I wrapped my legs round her neck, tied them into a knot and squeezed. As hard as I could until that little navel bubble popped out. <laughs> off the mirror and came back to ping her in her hat. <laughs> Tell me, do you have fuzzy little toys lying about your house? Are you taking your children to ballet class and to soccer practice? You're so naive. <laughs> investing in their development, you should be investing in your own development. Sleep on a mat, eat stale bread, hard in your heart. <laughs> My son came home with the logo of his favorite video game tattooed on his chest. <laughs> yes, we all miss him very much. <laughs> I sold him for profit to the gypsy. His brother decided he should like to become the Marlboro Man. Smoking in the house. 
after dinner, every night. <laughs> Did I talk to him? Did I guide him into a new decision? No. I called the Department of Homeland Security and learned how to waterboard. <laughs> it's very satisfying. <laughs> Did you think you need love and understanding to parent? No. You need a will of iron, you need a heart of stone, and a reasonable collection of alibis. <laughs> Finally, my daughter, my last daughter, pretty girl, she has a boyfriend. His name is Derelict. Or Daryl or Derek or something. <laughs> That's how you marry. They've chosen a zombie themed wedding. <laughs> what? A zombie themed wedding over my dead body? <gasps> oh, mother, my daughter protested. Mother, Daryl loves zombie films. It'll be so novel, don't you think? If you have but a zombie themed wedding, I will throw my bloody body down upon the aisle. You'll have to step over me to get to him. <laughs> my daughter answered me in so much earnestness and sincerity. She said, Mother, how lovely of you. Your bloody body will match our decor. <laughs> simple sentiment that I must abandon the third option altogether, no matter how much I might enjoy it. I must find that book and close it for once and for all, for ever, and realize all that I really can do is hope for the best and pray to God they make it. But ma'am, Toastmaster, I'm going to keep the cape. <laughs>
Would all of our contestants please come up here on the stage and can join me for that fun free interview? Toastmasters for six years now. I'm representing the Michigan Avenue Toastmasters. Woo! I have a, a CL and a CC, but I've completed over 30 speeches. Oh, yeah. Outside of Inspired and through Toastmasters, I learn how to package it and inspire other people, just like how I've been inspired. So it's like a circle of life. <laughs> that probably tries truth with your favorite quote, which is uh, Unexamined life is not worth living. to look in the mirror to, and we have to be honest with ourselves, okay, what do we need to work on? And the third part is how can we serve others through other people's experience and what I've learned and pass it on. So that's why I love that quote by Plato. No, you both think you know. Yeah. <laughs> Very good, and thank you so much. And we Toastmasters for years now. Okay, and what club are you representing? I'm representing Maywood! I will soon be completed with my ACB and my leadership. such a short time, even if we live to be 150. It's just a speck, a quark of time in the universe, and I always say, if not now, W-A-G-N, will you choose the W-I-N? Oh, right? very good. So, win, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much. Toastmasters for three years, representing Niles Township Toastmasters. Yay! Yay, Niles. And I just completed my DTM just recently. Right. I noticed too on your um, your, your um, inspirational talk. Would you like to share that with me, uh, audience? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. What I said in my favorite quote was always inspire your children when they're younger because they will inspire you when you're older. Okay. And this is a true situation in my case because both of my boys, my older one who I mentioned in the speech is a job with Honeywell in Kansas City and my younger one will be headed to college next year. And I kid you not guys, if it wasn't for them, I would not literally be standing over here. 
because it is their communication power that has inspired me and wanted me to join Toastmasters. To be able to converse with them the way they converse. Obviously they have an advantage because they were born and brought up over here and we don't. But Toastmasters does that for me and that's the reason why I joined Toastmasters. Toastmaster for eight months now. Oh. And I represent Next Step Toastmaster High Center. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I completed project number six wow. of the commu uh, Captain Communicator two weeks ago. context of something else, but I, I have another favorite quote if I may. <laughs> so, there are a lot of mature people here and they gave a lot of good favorite quotes. Um, my favorite quote is, I like quoting great men, and it was written by me. <laughs> 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 Alright, um, interesting hobby, I, I, I am a pilot by training as well. I don't fly as a commercial pilot, but I'm a commercial pilot by training, so flying and shooting, not at the same time, are my favorite <laughs> <laughs> hobbies. So I don't go that well with the TSA anymore. <laughs> <laughs> So neat, Patrick, like from our um, one of the clubs I was at, just uh, connecting up with the face. But then I rejoined, I think it was like uh, May or April this year, a different club. Very good. And what is your postmaster education level? And that's another complication. <laughs> <laughs> you people change the terminology. So there used to be governors, now they're, well, anyway. Um, ATM Silver, which is different, but it, 
they're saying that's what I am. You know. <laughs> and, no, that just means I'm old. <laughs> and then uh, the other one, um, A L B, A L bronze. Oh, well, I love your talk. Confessions are being heard in the game. <laughs> 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 I don't know if you caught that, but when I was leaving the stage, she like blessed me. <laughs> I feel like I needed special attention. <laughs> In our eighth contestant <laughs> is Calvin Against Jr. And I'd like to know how long you've been in Toastmasters? I've been in Toastmasters for going on four years now. I represent Club. One of the best of the West. Yeah. Beyond the Sea. Woo! One, three, four, eight, three, one, one. Yeah! I am a DTM. I have been a theatrical actor and director in Chicago Theater for 13 years now. My wife and I used to run a non-profit theater company. I've been an actor, director, writer, and producer.
next number. Five, four, six, two, nine, six. Come on up. Six, seven, eight, six, four, eight.
Betty Kim, Tyvek.